right, folks, I think we're going to get started here. Well, it's good to see you all. Happy March. It's still daylight outside. That's exciting. Um, okay, so welcome everyone and welcome to those who are watching from home as well. Uh, per usual, for those of you here tonight, if you haven't already, we'd love for you to sign in so we can get an accurate count of attendance. Um, you can use that form to also sign up for our newsletter um, and you can do that at the conclusion of tonight's talk. My name is Felicia and I am the museum coordinator for the Lacey Museum. For tonight's program, we are joined by Rabbi Seth Goldstein, spiritual leader at Temple Beth Hatfilo. He will be sharing the history of Jewish people in the US and Washington in particular, and Judaism as a faith, tradition, and culture. So before we begin uh, our program tonight, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement and some museum news. Turn the page too soon. <laughs> the Lacey Museum is on the ancestral land of the tribal people of the Treaty of Medicine Creek, including the Nisqually Indian Tribe and Squaxin Island Tribe. We acknowledge and remember those tribal people not recognized today who were absorbed or relocated into other tribes for survival. We recognize the ancestors and their descendants who are still here. We recognize and respect the tribal people of the Treaty of Medicine Creek as the traditional stewards of this land since time immemorial and their role today in taking care of these lands in perpetuity. We recognize and have the responsibility to call attention to the histories of dispossession, forced removal, and abridged treaty rights that allowed our nation, state, and city to develop as they have today. We recommend that community members read the Medicine Creek Treaty of 1854. Okay, we'd love to see you at the museum. We are open Thursdays and Fridays, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. and Saturdays, 10 to 4. Um, come view our Smithsonian poster exhibit called Journey Stories. This exhibit explores how movement has shaped our nation with a look at American expansion and migration from the earliest settlers and Native American displacement to the effects of transportation on modern mobility. We are also selling Thurston County Historical Journals after the completion of tonight's program. If you are interested in those, we will uh, have those available on the back table. Uh, we can take card or cash payments, and then we also have more available for purchase at the museum. Okay, coming up next month, we hope you'll join us for our April History Talk with Lynn Grotsky and Lisa Brodoff, who are in the audience tonight. Hello. <laughs> in this talk, they'll share their story of a two-year court battle that secured parenting rights for themselves and for all other same-sex couples in the state of Washington and then extended throughout the nation. They'll discuss the local and national coalitions that helped bring about second parent adoption and later a string of other victories for the LGBTQ plus community. Okay, so for tonight's program, we will hold our Q&A section at the end. Uh, we will do our best to get uh, questions from our in-person and online attendees. So for those online, you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to put that in the um, chat box. And then for those in person, I will be coming around with a microphone because folks at home can't hear your questions if they don't hear it on the microphone. Um, so go ahead and raise your hand and I will come around with that. Uh, now I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, Rabbi Seth Goldstein. <laughs> Rabbi Seth Goldstein has served as the spiritual leader of Temple Beth Hatfilo and Olympia since his ordination in 2003. He is both committed to creating vibrant Jewish community and using a spiritual voice to speak to issues of social justice and common concern. Rabbi Goldstein is the author of numerous published articles, essays, liturgy, and poetry, and has been quoted in major news outlets and has an active presence in teaching Judaism on social media. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. All right, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> I think the other slides were nicer than my slides, but... Um, well, so great to be here uh, tonight and uh, to be able to share a bit of uh, Jewish history here in our region. Uh, one thing that didn't come up in my 
bio, because it shouldn't be there, is that I'm not a trained historian. I'm not a, a professional historian, but I am somebody who is uh, deeply committed to the Jewish community and uh, always find specific, uh, especially um, history, uh, Jewish community as well, to be uh, of interest, kind of a, a hobby to, uh, an avocation to go with my vocation uh, as a rabbi. So I'll share a little bit more about me. I'm not originally from this area. I'm originally from back east. I'm from New York. And, uh, but I've been out here 20 years, as was mentioned. And what's interesting to me in, in thinking about uh, this topic, really since I've been here, is just the uh, kind of general patterns and overview of Jewish history and how it, it kind of differed uh, from where I am, where I'm from back east uh, to here, as we think about just the history of the United States and the difference there, uh, New York, you know, part of the original um, colonies, really an early uh, uh, or a initial setting uh, entry point for, for Jewish immigration, for, for Jews, and then thinking about here in terms of uh, the expansion of the West and the um, uh, history that goes with that and just sort of seeing the difference. And it was a very different Jewish community, uh, Jewish history that I was uh, familiar with coming from back east. So it's been very interesting to kind of learn and think about those larger patterns as well as what's going on here in, um, in our region. So I'm going to just share some uh, sort of overview and um, highlights of our Jewish history here and to, uh, again, yeah, as was mentioned, to be able to entertain questions really about anything aspect. I mean, I'm here, so you can ask me anything. How's that? Uh, and uh, I had said 150 years, because well, we'll see in a, in a moment why that's significant. And uh, it was very interesting when I didn't realize, um, uh, well, 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 we'll get there, never mind, about the uh, the dating of the Medicine Creek Treaty alongside with the beginning of Jewish history in, in this region. And I wonder if there's things there. So wait, the bottom one, first one, top one. There we go. So I, I kind of want to say what is Jewish history when, when I mention that. And I think um, part of uh, what came out in the introduction to, or to talk about the Judaism, uh, what is Judaism, right? What is uh, Judaism as a, uh, as a faith, as a culture, as a tradition? And so when we say Jewish history, I mean, when we think about Judaism, uh, people are familiar with Judaism as a faith uh, tradition, as a spiritual tradition, but really all throughout, Judaism has also been what we sometimes call an ethno-religion, the sense that there is a, a religious component uh, rooted in uh, spirituality and a religious tradition, but because of that, especially because of one being a minority religious tradition throughout, uh, throughout its history, has taken on aspects of ethnicity and culture as well. And that Jews, uh, Jewish communities have existed kind of all over the world and have maintained not only connections with the larger cultures in which they live, but also their own kind of our own internal uh, cultures, traditions that we associate with, with cultures, with, with civilizations like uh, language, like literature, like food ways and things like that. And so when we talk about Jewish history, really tracing that as well. We're not necessarily tracing a, uh, you know, the roots of a, of a religious tradition. And there is definitely a, uh, you know, religious history that we can trace within Judaism in terms of uh, development of, you know, sacred texts and spiritual communities and, and textual interpretation and religious practice and whatnot. Uh, in this case, we're thinking about uh, Jews as a people. Right, Jews as a people, that that is also something that uh, uh, Jewish community has been uh, described as being uh, a nation on one hand or a, a people, peoplehood. And this idea that Jewish communities, uh, you know, carry forward these cultural elements and then have their own history uh, is, is a part of that. So when we talk, when we get into it, we're a lot of these people, especially some of the early settlers here, I don't. Uh, we're sometimes even a-religious or indifferent to religion. Uh, may or may not have various aspects of religious tradition um, or spiritual beliefs, but identified as Jewish culturally, uh, ethnically, and that was a major part of what they are. And so, and developed institutions to maintain that, uh, whether or not they were uh, kind of spiritual institutions, if that makes if that makes sense. So that's. 
kind of what I want to say when we think about what Jewish history is all about. Um, one thing I wanted to start off with, and I learned that there's this little, oh yeah, look at that thing, that's really cool. So you can learn that for next time, Lily, so you got, you got that as well. Um, just wanted to put things in the context of overall uh, Jewish immigration. So uh, Jews primarily in the United States are products of immigration. And uh, Jews have uh, came to this country uh, from other places, from its earliest history. And what I want to, here's on the left is a picture of Ellis Island, sort of a classic uh, picture of immigration. Uh, many uh, immigrants coming through Ellis Island, including my, my own ancestors. Uh, I don't know if they're Jews, I just took a picture of Ellis Island there, but uh, just to demonstrate. But I did want to show on the right this um, kind of overall pattern of Jewish immigration to the United States. And you, as we'll see in a moment too, the Jewish uh, migration to the South Sound kind of mimics this as well. Uh, in the earliest days of the United States, oops, wrong button there. Oh yeah, look at that. Um, and I'm gonna get into some of these terms as well, that the Jews uh, in the early part of the, I think the first Jews came to the United States in, in around the late 1600s and uh, to New York. There were uh, about 30 uh, Jews who came up from uh, Brazil, and they were Portuguese uh, by descent. And so the earliest immigrants to the United States, Jewish immigrants, were of Sephardic descent. Uh, Sephardic descent refers to uh, Jews who are trace their ancestry to the Iberian Peninsula, essentially, um, to Spain, Portugal, and whatnot. You could think about some of the early, uh, if you remember your uh, kind of colonial history and um, ex exploratory history in Spain and, and Portugal. Um, a lot of the Jews were, or the early Jews in uh, the country in the United States, traced their ancestry uh, to Sephardic um, uh, populations. And so, you know, Spain, Portugal, but then also some of those Spanish colonies like Brazil, for example. Um, and you see early, some of the earliest synagogues, like in New York, going back, there's the Spanish or Portuguese synagogue. There are uh, early remnants of Sephardic um, community. There is actually now a more contemporary Sephardic community also in Seattle. Seattle hosts one of the largest uh, Sephardic communities in the United States. Uh, Jews primarily from, um, from Greece, from Rhodes, and from Turkey uh, made their home in Seattle. It's not the South Sound, I know I'm cheating a little bit, but uh, uh, in later waves of immigration, um, primarily because of industry and you know, fishing industry and things. Uh, after the, the next major wave of Jewish immigration that came to this country were primarily from Central Europe, uh, from Germany. And that's what it says right there, German immigration, and that's all through the mid 1800s. And um, so that was all German immigration. You know, it all has to do with the conditions of Jewish community in Europe at the time, uh, where Jews were able to leave. Uh, and so a lot of Jews in, in the mid 1800s were leaving Germany, Central Europe, and making their way to the United States. And that kind of follows the pattern all throughout the United States. The earliest, the Jews following the Sephardic Jews were, were German primarily. And that sort of tapers off a bit or slows down in the late 1800s, primarily because conditions for German Jews in Europe be, got better um, in terms of uh, emancipation and acceptance, at least temporarily acceptance, uh, into European. We know that things don't work out as well. Um, but at least at that time, and German immigration kind of tapered off only to be um, uh, followed by large waves of Jewish immigration from Eastern Europe, from Russia, from Poland, uh, basically f both seeking opportunity, as is the case, but also fleeing persecution, that this was a, a really bad time for Jews in um, Eastern Europe. And uh, due to uh, rampant anti-Semitism and pogroms and uh, actions against Jewish communities, so many, many Jews left uh, in the late 1800s, early part of the uh, 20th century. And actually, uh, up until around the 1920s, and we'll talk a little bit about that maybe towards the end. Um, so that was the major wave of uh, Jewish immigration. And then, you know, it continued. I mean, there was still, 
Jewish immigration, it's not always a, a straight line, but as you see there, uh, after World War II, many Holocaust survivors uh, came, and then um, immigrants from the former Soviet Union uh, comprised sort of what are the majority of Jewish immigrants uh, uh, today. So, um, so that's, and, you know, I can trace my ancestry, I trace to that early part of the 20th century, Jews fleeing Eastern Europe. My ancestors came from from the Ukraine, from, from Poland, and from Romania. And so I sort of trace, I mean, I, I, part of the other interest in history is during the lockdown, which we're cel celebrating <laughs> now, <clears throat> four years hence, uh, was uh, I did a lot of ancestry stuff. So that was kind of interesting. So that's where, but I, um, so we'll see that this kind of pattern is about to be repeated as we turn our attention to um, the South Sound. Um, so the first Jewish residents uh, of Olympia, so the first Jews in this area came to Olympia Tumwater and um, settled in, uh, in Olympia and came around the 1850s. In fact, the first was uh, in 1853 was Louis Spetman. And um, that picture was on the main slide as well and, and up here. Uh, and most of these folks who came, they were of German ancestry, again, following that pattern and uh, were primarily uh, merchants um, and setting up uh, shops. They usually came from, they didn't come directly from Germany. They mostly made their way kind of across the country, sort of making their way, finally find, looking for opportunity. And uh, many came up from via California up to the Northwest uh, seeking new opportunity. At that time, Olympia in 1850s was, probably had about 250 residents. It was small and that was the thing I hadn't, um, I'll have to do a little bit of research on that. I'm just interesting about the lining up of the Medicine Creek Treaty and, and that they're sort of uh, around the same time, uh, Jews coming to this area. Uh, one thing I, I, I do want to share, uh, a wonderful book that was written a couple years ago uh, called Family of Strangers, uh, Building a Jewish Community in Washington State. It's a history of the Jewish community in the state of Washington. Um, just wanted to share what was written about um, these folks, uh, I think it sort of just encapsulates what brought um, Jews to this community. Uh, unlike many pioneers, few of the early arriving Jews, came, few of the early arri earlier arriving Jews came to farm or mine. Rather, these adventurers were urban pioneers, part of what one historian called the central story of the 19th century West, that of an expanding economy linking cities to the small towns of the countrysides. Jewish entrepreneurs played a large role in connecting the vast rural areas of Washington territory to its growing towns, as well as to San Francisco, the Midwest, and the world beyond. They arrived in the newly formed Washington territory in small numbers, some with family financial ties that enabled them to innovate, take business risks, and thus profit from the growth of the territory. In the territorial years, most who came to the Northwest were unmarried and without families. Those early settlers began as small merchants, married, and started families uh, later. So that was the, um, and so it was basically a, a series of you know, folks who kind of made their way looking for, and mostly in, in, uh, in dry goods and shipping and trading uh, up and down the East Coast. So a couple of those early names uh, was uh, Louis Bettman, uh, who had Bettman's Dry Goods. That building no longer exists uh, downtown, although there is a remnant of the Bettman family. Uh, there is a, a building uh, on, um, it's not ninth, it's eight, on ninth. It's a blue house, you might reckon, I should have put a picture, uh, called the Bettman House, which was a house that Louis Bettman built for his daughter when she got married. And it still stands, and it's currently apartment buildings, uh, and it's behind where the synagogue is currently located. Uh, next to him is uh, Mitchell Harris, uh, the Harris family, uh, Harris Dry Goods, uh, op uh, again, sort of selling goods and wares uh, in downtown Olympia. Uh, Harris Dry Goods building still stands. It's the building uh, where it's now divided into three. It's where, um, what's there now? Batdorf and Bronson used to be there before they closed and, and moved down the block. So there's the um, uh, La Gitana and... Um, what am I missing? What's in the middle now? Uptown yeah, Uptown Grill. Yes, Uptown Grill. Uh, that's the Harris Dry Goods building where uh, Mitchell Harris 
had his uh, store and his father's. He inherited the store from his father. Uh, and Mitchell Harris, I put him up there because he has the distinction in 1910 of becoming the first Jewish mayor of Olympia. So we now have another Jewish mayor, but it's not the first. Yeah. Mitchell Harris was the first in 1910. Uh, so that's true. OK, yes. <laughs> uh, Dante Payne is also Jewish. So he's uh, um, so, uh, so involved, and a lot of these folks were also very involved in civic affairs, uh, as you know, Mitch, not always holding a public office, but involved in a lot of things. A lot were involved in the Masonic Lodge and things. Another uh, resident, uh, a notable resident of uh, Olympia in those early days, is Gustav Rosenthal. Uh, that's a picture of his store in the middle, and that's kind of him right there in the middle uh, there, as was well the close up picture there. This is a neat. Uh, thing I found this was a um, it's a historical record of his uh, arrival. He arrived, uh, you know, he was born in Germany on July 4th, so I guess he had to follow that and become uh, come to America. And um, he made his way, arrived in Washington in June 12th, 1863. You see it there with his family. He was a merchant. He was also a very successful merchant uh, in town, really trading things, lots like really any things, kind of up and down the West Coast. Um, and also kind of very involved in uh, civic affairs. Didn't hold public office, but, uh, but was involved in, in the community. And it's a lot of these early pioneers. Again, for thinking of a town of 250 some odd people, uh, got, had to be, uh, were to be very involved. None of these, interestingly enough, uh, none of these families remained in Olympia uh, for the long term. They all kind of moved on. Uh, in, at various times, I tried to track down some families. I know Gustav Rosenthal um, eventually made his way to the Chicago area, uh, where he died, I think, following family. But they all were, you know, they were merchants, so they kept, so they um, uh, moved on, or their children kind of moved on as well. So it's the next wave that we see more longevity in terms of keeping the community here. But all these early pioneers, these early uh, Jewish residents in Olympia, uh, in the South Sound, all kind of moved on at various points, but, but made their mark. And we're going to revisit Gustav Rosenthal because he, he plays a role in our contemporary Jewish community as well in a very interesting way. Um, one of the other interesting aspects of Jewish uh, history in our region is that uh, of Edward Solomon, who was the eighth territorial governor of, uh, of the Washington Territory. So uh, he was a, um, that's the picture. Uh, Battle of Gettysburg there. He was a Gettys, uh, Battle of Gettysburg uh, hero, uh, rising to the rank of Brigadier General. And then after the war, he was appointed uh, by President Grant to serve as the uh, eighth territorial governor uh, in Washington Territory. That's the territorial uh, uh, center right there. Um, he, uh, uh, young man in his 30s, came here. He only served a couple of years. Uh, he, made, uh, he was appointed in 1870 but was somewhat also involved in the community and um, made uh, involved with the Masonic Lodge as well. And apparently was a very interesting character. There was a interesting, uh, you know, just again from that history book, there's this interesting little anecdote um, about him from, uh, from a history of, by Gordon Newell. It says, speaking with a thick German accent and described as short, plump, and sporting a magnificent spiked German mustache and goatee, Edward S. Solomon, Olympia's uh, territorial governor, often incited hilarity. Disembarking from the steamboat at Yesler's Wharf, he climbed Mill Street, this is up in Seattle, of course, made of slab wood covered with partly rotted sawdust from Yesler's Mill, well mixed with horse droppings, and plunged into his speech to the waiting crowd. Suddenly, he paused, stooped down and gathered a handful of odorous street covering. Mein Gott, he explained, what a splendid soil for cabbages. <laughs> so apparently he was uh, quite a character um, and uh, lasted just a couple of years. Uh, I think he, uh, one thing I was reading is that he got caught up in some of the scandals of the Grant administration <laughs> and uh, then resigned his position. He eventually moved down to San Francisco uh, and had a successful career there as well and uh, passed away. That's his obituary uh, in San Francisco. Uh, so just another, again, interesting aspect of Jewish history to have that, um, you know, again, he was also a German Jew, born in Germany, uh, you know, 
uh, settled here, eventually, you know, joined the army during the Civil War, and um, and then rose in, in in politics. So once we start to have community, you know, the next thing that follows is kind of community organization, right? So the um, once you have uh, like sort of getting to this idea that you know I don't know about the religiosity. I can probably say that they weren't very religious, uh, and you'll see why in a second, because, um, but they did find the need to join together and to form a community because they were, um, there's a term in Yiddish that we call landsmen, that they're people of the same place, right? They have the same cultural community identity. And so in 1874, uh, the, those folks that I mentioned and a few others got together and formed the Hebrew Benevolent Association, which, as it turns out, uh, which was the first Jewish organization in the state of Washington. Uh, this is, again, the earlier settlers. This wasn't in Seattle. They were in uh, here, the first Jewish settlers in, in Olympia, in Washington state, were settled here. And so these are a copy of the Articles of Incorporation of this first uh, organization. I have a another copy right here. And because um, I just wanted to read to you uh, what this was forming. This was formed, and so when I say 150 years, even though the first arrivals came in the 1850s, uh, this is significant because this organization was established in January 19th, 1874. So 150 years this year, the first Jewish organization in the state of Washington. Um, you know, this was some of the early name, Gustav Rosenthal, Louis Spetman, um, others formed this association, the Hebrew Benevolent Association of Puget Sound. Um, all persons, Article 3, all persons of the Jewish faith over 21 years of age shall be eligible to membership by paying the sum of $5. It's pretty good dues amount. And so the first, um, and here's where we get to sort of the interesting aspect of, of the development of the Jewish community here, Article 4. Um, she can't really read it, so like down here, but it says, the object of this association shall be to purchase a suitable piece of land for the purpose of a Jewish burial ground and to keep and maintain the same for the use and benefit of the members of this association and their families and for the use of the other members of the Jewish faith on such terms as may be from time to time prescribed by the bylaws of the association. And it shall further be the object of this association to aid and assist poor and distressed co-religionists as far as the means of the association permit and further to acquire and own such real estate as becomes necessary to carry out the objects of the association. So I think what's interesting here in terms of thinking about the development of Jewish community in specific, but perhaps any, any community, immigrant community that comes, is that their first interest, the first thing that brought them together uh, as an organization is to form a cemetery. And that was the, the real need, that once you sort of settle and you have a death in the family, you need some place to bury them. And that is what kind of defined their presence in Olympia in this area was the ability to create a cemetery. So this first organization was, um, was formed specifically with that purpose. And when I get to say, like, I'm not sure about the religiosity, this predates the establishment of a synagogue by about 50 years. So they didn't come and form a synagogue, <laughs> right? They didn't come and form a worship space, but the first association uh, was to bury their dead and to take care of one another. It was a mutual aid society as well. Uh, and uh, to form the cemetery and also to, uh, to support one another. The, um, so that's what they did. Uh, they, they purchased land. And so not only is the South Sound home to the first Jewish organization in the state of Washington, but also home to the first and oldest Jewish cemetery in, uh, in Washington, which still exists. <clears throat> We're still taking people in. Uh, this is a copy of the uh, kind of uh, purchase agreement. Uh, for the, uh, the cemetery land that um, is uh, still located. So the, what's interesting here, before I talk about the cemetery piece, you know, it's a little hard to read, but what was interesting, as I mentioned, a lot of these immigrants were involved in the Masonic Lodge. Uh, 
the early, the Hebrew Benevolent Association purchased three acres of land from the Masons. Uh, this is in, currently it's in Tumwater, right, right by, um, right off of, right by the Safeway there, that large Masonic cemetery, the Jewish cemetery is located there. Uh, originally purchased about three acres from the Masons. Uh, and, but all these guys were also kind of part of the Masons as well. So this uh, right up here, the person signing on behalf of the Masons in the sale agreement is Edward Solomon, the uh, Jewish territorial governor. So that was kind of interesting. Um, so the uh, Jewish community bought, you know, as part two and, and started to and formed a cemetery. Now later on about in 19, just to follow this line of the cemetery, um, in about, at about 1922, the uh, Jewish community, maybe realizing that they had more land than they needed, perhaps, I don't know, uh, deeded back to the Masons a large part of that land, retaining uh, a section, a Jewish uh, cemetery section, uh, and included in that perpetual care. So the, way, so the cemetery now, the Jewish cemetery that we uh, maintain, uh, is, all, is within the Masonic Cemetery. So if you've ever been there, if you know where the Masonic Cemetery is, uh, if you go, it's hard to see from the road, but you can go into the Masonic Cemetery and you'll see there'll be a section somewhat in the middle that's kind of chained off, and that's the Jewish section. And if you go in there, you'll see that there are graves from the late 1800s, again, from this era um, of establishment of the cemetery. And so that was deeded back and sort of controlled, uh, overseen by the Masons. They take care of it for us on behalf of the Jewish community, even though we manage uh, the cemetery. And uh, in 1955, the uh, Hebrew Benevolent Society folded, and actually Temple Beth Hatfilo, which we'll get to next, uh, absorbed the Hebrew Benevolent Association. So again, they're, they're kind of like the same people. So uh, at that point, they didn't see a separate need to have, uh, or a need to have a separate organization. So once the, sem the synagogue was established in the 1955, uh, it, we, um, TBH, Temple Beth Atfilo, absorbed uh, the cemetery. So we now manage the cemetery as well. And so I guess in a way, we are the direct inheritors of the Hebrew Devil Association. So we're the oldest Jewish organization in, the, in Washington, I'll say that. Uh, and here's, uh, here's a picture of the cemetery. It's actually a little bit dated because we updated some things, but um, you can uh, see if you, again, you can go and visit. Uh, it's right within the Masonic Memorial Park. And again, this is the same land that, the, uh, that was purchased in, 18, in the late 1870s, um, and we're still using it. Following that, again, as I mentioned, a lot of the uh, early uh, Ger German settlers kind of moved on, um, and they're not really, uh, there isn't really much, aside from like the Bettman House and some things, there aren't really um, those families still here. And then in the late, in the early 1900s, or late 1800s, early 1900s, the second, this other wave of Jewish immigration that I mentioned from Eastern Europe uh, came and also followed uh, here. Same with, um, the South Sound. So the neck, a lot of uh, immigrants from, uh, from Eastern Europe also found their way here, again, following opportunity, mostly merchants, and setting up a variety of businesses. And it's these families that some of you might be familiar with, and some of these families that are still uh, here and present in our community, and uh, are even, you know, their descendants are part of, the, part of our community. So here we have, um, on the right, we have the Bean family. Um, uh, Jacob Bean and uh, Earl Bean, their uh, son, they were the original owners. First, they owned Olympia Junk Company, which became Olympia Supply, uh, the hardware store downtown. The hardware, the store still exists. Uh, the Bean family sold it a, a few years ago, uh, but that's one of the early businesses that was um, founded by Jewish uh, business. There's the Goldberg family that ran Goldberg Furniture. Uh, for many years, Hollanders that ran a junk business, uh, Anna Blum's bookstore that's now actually Browser's Books, that sort of evolved into Browser's Books. So a lot of these uh, early businesses, again, some of the businesses that have remnants uh, still around, whether it's Olympia Supply, uh, uh, the Olympia Canning Company, Ladies Furnishings uh, Family, um, a dry cleaner, junk buyer. So see, there's some of the jobs. Uh, and one apparently state worker from the founders of the, the synagogue, uh, William Oppenheimer, who uh, 
who worked for the State Department of Finance. But most of the other early founders uh, of the, or members of the Jewish community at this time were, again, business people, owned local businesses, merchants, um, and whatnot. So it's the Bean family, uh, just a few pictures. And then, so these folks who I think were probably a bit more religious or involved in the spiritual life, uh, decided to get together and, and to form a synagogue. And so in 1937, incorporated as Beth Hatfilo, which uh, is kind of an anglicized version of saying Beit Hatfila, which means house of prayer, and formed a synagogue uh, and built this. Um, and the synagogue was, de was dedicated in 1938. Uh, this building still stands. If you go down to the corner of 8th and Jefferson uh, downtown, uh, right near the post office, it, uh, it was the home of Temple Beth Atfilo till uh, 2004 uh, when we sold it and moved. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, and currently, it's an Anglican church. Uh, we, um, uh, we sold it to K Records. So it was, a, uh, but K Records sold it to an Anglican church. So um, uh, that was kind of a, When we sold the building, we wanted to sell it to someone who wasn't going to knock it down. Uh, we, we knew we couldn't hold on to it but we uh, wanted to maintain that history. And so um, uh, wanted to, and so K Records was a willing uh, tenant uh, or willing purchaser. Uh, we did stipulate though that if, if you know, down the road it does get sold at some point to be knocked down that we would reclaim some aspects of the building for historical purposes. In fact, a number of years ago, that circle, it's hard to see in this picture, is actually a stained glass star of David. Uh, a number of uh, a few years ago, K Records had to do some work on the building, and they had to remove that window. So they called me up and said, OK, come get your, your window. And we did. So we, we took it, and we restored it, and we hung it up in our building, so um, wanting to maintain that history. So these earlier folks, a lot of these early folks were, um, were more traditional in their practice, orthodox in their practice. Uh, the community was too small to have a rabbi, so they would either uh, be lay-led uh, in their religious services or bring in uh, visiting rabbis from various places. Um, and that's kind of how the community uh, went on for a, a number of years. Again, sort of small grassroots community, the local merchants who formed, uh, formed the synagogue. They did have some larger um, uh, connections. So it's actually uh, right here, the three shuls. Shuls a Yiddish word for synagogue. Uh, there are actually three synagogues, all built around the same floor plan and building design in Centralia, Aberdeen, and Olympia. These communities would get together uh, on occasion as well uh, and have joint events. There was overlap with families between these three, among these three communities. Uh, currently, only the Olympia building. Uh, well, no, the, the, never mind. The, um, the building that you see here on the right, this is um, Aberdeen. Uh, there is still a Jewish community in Aberdeen, a very small Jewish community in Aberdeen. Um, but the, the original synagogue building that was here in this dedication uh, picture is no longer. It was knocked down, and, and a new building was rebuilt. Uh, up there in the upper right is the Centralia Synagogue, Adath Israel. Both of those, Aberdeen and Centralia, were built in 1930, so a couple of years before um, uh, Olympia. In fact, I think at one point those communities had larger Jewish communities than Olympia, uh, but as business declined, it shifted to, um, to Olympia. The, the building, the community in Centralia uh, folded in 1994. Actually, Temple Beth Hatfilo absorbed some of their assets. In fact, there's a little bit of... Uh, back and forth on social media this week because that building's now up for sale again. Um, it was sold, it went under a variety of different owners who tried to turn it into like a venue space or a restaurant space and now it's currently for sale if anybody wants to buy an old synagogue. Uh, price seems kind of reasonable. And then our synagogue here. So they were all kind of built on, the, you'll see, that you can see the distinct, the similarities between the two. Uh, one's out of wood, one's out of bricks, kind of like the three bears, I guess, or not three bears. Um, Goldilocks, yeah, whatever. The, uh, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow. Three little pigs, thank you. I always think that's like one's made out of brick, one's made out of wood, but the, uh, this was not made out of straw, I think. But, uh, but anyway, there's just this connection about the growing and there's uh, overlap with that. Um, and then this was just, I already mentioned this, this is the, this is the document that 
closed the Hebrew Benevolent Association, absorbed everything into Temple Beth HaTfilo, and uh, so that was primary, the primary Jewish institution uh, for a number of years. Um, I did mention, I realized, I, for some reason, I think I accidentally deleted a slide, but I did want to say a word about rabbinic leadership. So there was a, um, uh, um, as I mentioned, the community was very small, could not afford a rabbi for many years. Uh, there was an interesting, uh, in, in um, kind of the mid, in about 1940, 1941, uh, the Olympia community and the Aberdeen community sponsored a Rabbi Albert Wolf from Dresden, Germany to escape from Germany you know, in advance of the Holocaust. And he served those two communities for about two years uh, before moving on to uh, Chicago. And so that was the, uh, the kind of first rabbi uh, in this area. And uh, we didn't get another rabbi till the mid uh, 1980s, where first uh, Rabbi Vicki Hollander was a part-time rabbi uh, here at Temple Beth Atfilo, followed by Rabbi Marna Sapsowitz, um, who served for 13 years, and then me in uh, 2003 is when I came. So you can see for most of its history, there was no rabbi. It was really a, a community-based synagogue uh, building from the ground up. And uh, that's how it was for, for many years, because also the community kind of maintained a, um, a steady uh, population. Wasn't, uh, didn't grow a lot. It was about 20 to 30 families throughout most of its history until you get to the late 60s and 70s when the community really started to grow based on the, you know, with the establishment of the Evergreen State College, with the growth of state government, that's when you start to see the Jewish community really begin to, to grow and um, take shape. Again, bring on a rabbi, uh, grow, start to form some of the other uh, aspects of Jewish community that we see, not just maintaining the cemetery, but a school for children, uh, other, benevolent, you know, other benevolent events, having other programs, fundraising, uh, doing charitable work, uh, having social events, things like that. And so that's when the community started to grow in those uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Until um, about 2004, when we, uh, Temple Beth HaTfilo, uh, moved to a new home that in the center there is Ben Bean, so the, uh, who ran Oli Supply for, for a number of years, and uh, the son of Earl Bean, son of Jacob Bean, who started the business. And what he's carrying right there is, is our holy Torah scroll, our, our, our Torah scroll, which is an important ritual object, which includes, it's a handwritten scroll that uh, contains the first five books of the Bible, our Torah. And, uh, but what's significant about that is that scroll was brought by his grandfather from Europe to Olympia. Um, and in the early days before they built the synagogue in the 1930s would hold services either in people's homes or sometimes at the Eagles Club or sometimes at the Labor Temple until finally uh, establishing the synagogue in 1938, 37, 38, and then donating that Torah scroll, which we still use today uh, in our in our worship, so that he's carrying that. We had a ceremony in 2004 to carry to move from our old synagogue uh, right there on the corner of Eighth and Jefferson, a whole three blocks west, uh, where we purchased the uh, the um, Christian Science Church, uh, which is at the corner of Eighth and Washington. So uh, just a really nice testament to the growth of our Jewish community here and the establishment starting with those handful of families when Olympia was 250 uh, residents to now uh, our congregation has about 250 households. Um, we, it was a, it's a very sweet story. Uh, we were been looking for a new space for a while and um, one of our elders uh, members of our community from the Goldberg family, Eva Goldberg was, you know, there's people know each other and they, they uh, talk to each other and she always liked that building. And so one by, somebody talked to another and as it turned out, they were getting ready to <laughs> sell. And it just sort of happenstance. In, in Yiddish, we call that beshert. It means it was meant to be. Uh, so we, um, it never went on the market. We just um, were able to make an agreement to purchase that building. And we subsequently expanded it on the left. And uh, we've just now completed this courtyard project. And so you can see the real development of the Jewish uh, community. Moving away too from, although there are 
members of the Jewish community who are still merchants and, and, and business folks. A lot of folks now are either associated with state government, as many people in Olympia are, or other professionals, um, uh, you know, the hospital. Some of the major employers in the town, in our area, are you know, where the Jewish community uh, is, is, um, finds itself. So we, um, and so currently now with growth, there's actually multiple uh, Jewish organizations uh, in town. There's Temple Beth Atfilo, which is the synagogue I serve. That is our primary and main and largest Jewish organization. Um, we did have, uh, I guess as every good, I don't know, Jewish community has, there's disagreement and break off groups sometimes. So there was a group that broke off from us in the mid 19 uh, 90s that formed another congregation called Congregation B'nai Torah that um, currently I think still exists in name only, but it's very it's very small. Most people have kind of moved on, and we do have an organization called Chabad of Olympia, which is an Orthodox uh, outreach organization. So a much more traditional group that um, kind of goes out to different communities and uh, sets up organizations. And so they're in Olympia just for the past 15 years. I think the Jewish population is about, uh, I was guessing this, just trying to extrapolate out of maybe 1,000 to 1,500 in this area, uh, maybe more. I mean, we do have, you know, with everything, a lot of association with, um, uh, you know, Joint Base Lewis McCord and just the region. I mean, this synagogue, the Jewish community here, uh, we don't, um, uh, the next largest Jewish community moving uh, away from Olympia, from the South Sound, is in Tacoma. Uh, moving south, uh, there really isn't much, you know, the central congregation closed. There was a small group in Aberdeen, but this is primarily for the uh, South Sound area where we're the, um, we're the region. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to say, and I wasn't planning on um, mentioning this or, you know, as part, but it's, I guess it's tangential to the Jewish history and, and thought about it as we were uh, um, beginning uh, in terms of this being 150 years. There's also another anniversary uh, that we're uh, marking, or I'm thinking about this year, and that's um, 100 years. Uh, one of the interesting, I think, overlaps with uh, history here, as I mentioned, that if we look at this, um, the immigration patterns. I mean, one of the interesting things that a Jewish immigration to the United States dropped off heavily uh, in the mid-1920s, and that was because the United States uh, passed strict immigration laws that really closed the border uh, to, uh, to Jewish immigrants, not just the Jewish immigrants, but a whole host of kind of undesirable Jewish immigrants, mostly from Eastern and Southern Europe. Uh, one of the interesting things, or interesting maybe is a nice way to put it, maybe nefarious is another, that when they were instituting quotas in 1924 is the year that this a law passed the Johnson-Reed Act, 1924, uh, or sometimes called the National Origins Act. They, this is the first time the United States instituted quotas for immigration. And they based quotas, uh, you know, we have a census every 10 years, right? This law was passed in 1924. The quotas were based not on the 1920 census, but they were based on the 1890 census. So they were based on the census prior to this major wave of immigration. So if they had done it for 1920, the numbers would be much higher. But they specifically, planfully, based the quotas on the 1890 census, so the numbers were depressed. Jewish immigration dropped off tremendously uh, in 1920, and we know what happened in Europe uh, a couple um, decades, after, not that long after that. And the reason I mention it here is because, as I mentioned, that act was called the Johnson-Reed Act. Uh, the Johnson of the Johnson-Reed Act was Albert Johnson, who was from the state of Washington, uh, represented the state of Washington, the third district in the state of Washington, which in 1924 included our area. So it was our congressman who was the lead. He was a eugenicist. He was the lead uh, in doing that. So it's a kind of tangential, I think, to Jewish history, but I think it's an interesting fact when we think about uh, Jewish history to this uh, area, uh, South Sound, but to the U.S. is primarily based, rooted in immigration. That's why a lot of Jews are, are um, advocates for immigration. I'm not making a political commentator, commentary here, but just to say that there is this interesting tie-in with our uh, community here in the South Sound, 
uh, related to the immigrant history of the United States, uh, where it was our, our congressman who, who um, uh, instituted or, or took the lead on some of this. So it's, uh, again, it's kind of an interesting uh, aspect to Jewish history. So, um, and that's kind of brought us to this point. Uh, I think it's just, a, again, sort of fascinating to see the patterns, how they differ from what I grew up in the East Coast, which is a different type of Jewish history, but this uh, idea of this uh, pioneering spirit, as it were, or this you know, exploratory uh, following opportunity, which I think in some ways is a story we tell about the, uh, the West. Jews were no different than others in terms of pursuing that and uh, really um, you know, set the stage for you know, a robust and, and uh, create a, a solid foundation where the Jewish community is continuing to uh, have a strong presence in the South Sound, be involved in community and civic affairs, uh, and be a part of this greater community that we call home here in the South Sound. So, so with that, I guess I'll take uh, any and all questions that, uh, right? That's pretty good timing, right? All right. All right. It's still 45 minutes. So. A round of applause. Oh, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> For my reading glasses. That's all righty. Uh oh. I didn't make this chart. Um, I'm trying to understand the numbers on the chart on the right. Okay. Is that cumulative? I mean, are they in thousands? Because it makes it look like, uh, my knowledge is that there's about 6 million Jews in the United States today. Yeah. So that looks like um, millions and millions of Jewish people immigrated. Okay. Or is that cumulative? No, I have to go back and check what that okay. I, I said I'm not a historian. I'm not a statistician either, <laughs> or or very good with putting PowerPoint pictures. But yeah, I, I think that it is. Uh, yeah, it might be somewhat cumulative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. All right, that's a non-answer question. Thank you for that question. Oh, same question. Does that mean only five thousand came from or? Oh, I, mean, I chose a bad chart, didn't I? Yeah. Uh, I like it because it showed these waves, but um, yeah. yeah, no, I don't, I don't think, I think that this is like uh, for the primary, again, I, I wish I had to see. Maybe more a pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Pattern yeah, I think pattern. it's more of a pattern. Because also, too, like this isn't really showing that drop off, right? There is a, there is a drop off. You look at the pattern. So I, I'm going to guess it's cumulative. I'll go over here. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to guess it's cumulative, uh, but I apologize. I didn't, uh, it got cut off on the end because as I mentioned, there was, if you look at sort of a line chart, there was a drop off after the 1920s that picked up again a couple decades later. Um, somebody online said thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, and they noted that a lot of the history um, that was mentioned was of Jewish men. Um, is there anything known about the history of Jewish women in the South Sound area? Uh, I mean, yes, there was. Um, I guess they were all, uh, yeah, in fact, the, um, it's, I guess, parallel. And if, I mean, I think that a lot of these, um, you know, as I mentioned in the history book, a lot of the early merchants were Jewish men who arrived kind of single, but then eventually established families. Um, and then, I mean, there, there was always a time, especially since the, um, the establishment of Temple Beth Atfilo, that um, while traditionally within traditional Jewish community, men play more of a central role in the spiritual life of, in, within an orthodox setting. I mean, that's different now. You did have um, women who were supporting the organization through fundraising and, and social events and whatnot. And um, I mean, if you think about it too, like one of the historical, I mentioned the, the Bettman house that still stands was built for his daughter. So there are, um, there are evident, you know, remnants of the, the family. So yeah, it wasn't exclusively, um, I mean, Judaism, you know, like a lot of history is patriarchal as well. Uh, and so it's not surprising. Um, but there's been, and currently now it's where, you know, Temple Beth Atfilo is a Jewish community, is Jewish organization, is fully egalitarian. So, yeah, there's always, um, um, again, even though they might have arrived as single men mostly, there, there was, uh, yes, the role of Jewish women was important in building up the community as well even if they might have been more, uh, less public, but more behind the scenes. I think there was like a, a 
for a while, Temple Beth had to feel in the 50s and 60s had what they call the ladies auxiliary, which, uh, you know, was there to like hold events to support the organization and things like that. I have a question about the term Sephardic. Uh-huh. Uh, so you described it as being people being from Spain or Portugal, but were they originally Arabs who had migrated to Spain and Portugal? I'm confused about that because in contemporary, you know, sort of news writing, right. there's Sephardic meaning Middle Eastern Jews in right. Israel and Ashkenazi. So can you Right. Yeah, thank you. It's actually the other way around. So it's tracing um, tracing ancestry to Spain and Portugal pre-expulsion. So the uh, Jews were expelled from Spain in, in 1492, uh, and then a couple years after that, Portugal. And that's where you start to see, um, we should have mapped too. So those Jews kind of spread out down the Mediterranean. So that's when, while there are Jewish communities that exist in North Africa and uh, around the Middle East prior, it's after the expulsion, of the uh, Jews in 1492 that they start to grow because they, they move on that way. So that's kind of where it's originally ancestry. But yes, there are, so Sephardic becomes more of a, a blanket term to describe Jews of, um, who might originally place their ancestry but can be found in North Africa and other parts. And like I mentioned, the um, Sephardic community in Seattle currently um, traces its roots to Greece and to Rhodes and to Turkey. So that's sort of, again, Jews who would uh, sort of post-expulsion kind of landed and settled there. So, and they become a blanket term to describe Jews. And Ashkenazi uh, is the other term to describe Jews of uh, primarily Eastern, but also Central, Central and Eastern Europe. I mean, they're, they're, they're broad categories that then have kind of nuance. So, but weren't the Jews who were in Spain and Portugal, hadn't they come from North Africa? Uh, I think mean, the Jews got kicked out of everywhere, I guess, at some point. So no, they were, I, I don't, yeah, I think that that's, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's both and. I mean, I think that they both, uh, there were, uh, you know, my, I mean, you know, for example, my wife's uh, traces her ancestry, to, her mother was from Morocco and from North Africa, and so they trace, there's Jewish communities that in Morocco, North Africa, that trace their um, ancestry way back, like sort of way. Uh, prior to that, and then there are those that come. So I think it's kind of a mixing. I mean, that's the thing about uh, Jewish community that may say too that it's a very mobile community, right? So it's like how you, um, and yet also maintaining some of these ethnic identities in other places. So it's like, uh, so yes, there are Sephardic Jews uh, in North Africa, um, and. Uh, you know, kind of all across the Mediterranean. And then, you know, you have Sephardic communities outside and now in Europe, right? There's Sephardic communities now in France and, and in, in Canada and here in Seattle, but yet maintaining those, those ethnic ties. So, um, yeah, and this, it's a great question too, because you see, I mentioned earlier about the worldwide aspect of Jewish community that a lot of these communities, while they was share a heritage and share religious practices, there's also a lot of cultural differences, uh, language, food, uh, and so that's where you get, start to see Jew, Jews not just, it's not just about the religion, but about the ethnicity, because you will have these ethnic identities within Jewish community that help define. So even like the, between the German and the Eastern European Jews, there's distinctions. So you think, well, they're both from Europe, but no, they're, they're very different, uh, well, not very different, but there's differences uh, between those communities as well. Uh, between German Jews and Eastern European Jews. And it's kind of interesting that they didn't really overlap too much in the Jewish community here. Um, but you'd see sort of differences there as well. So, But yeah, so it's a kind of a whole history of dispersion and, and movements. So. Basically a life of refugees. Yeah, yeah. Thousands of years. Thousands of years, yeah. Okay, we have another online question, and someone has asked, do you know anything about the naming of Israel Road, which is between Capitol and Little Rock in Tumwater? Oh, that's interesting. I don't. I've always wondered about that. So if anybody else knows, um, the naming of Israel Road in Tumwater, why it's called Israel Road. I mean, Israel is a biblical name, so it's... Um, it's while it does become associated with the Jewish community, I mean, we in... Uh, Yisrael is um, 
uh, the term, you know, that is applied to Jewish community throughout its history and within liturgy. And, but it is a biblical name. From the, it's the name that Jacob gets uh, after uh, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, after wrestling with the angel in Genesis, gets a blessing and is given the name Yis, Is, Israel, Yisrael, which means one who wrestles with God. So it becomes a collective name for the Jewish people. We call ourselves Am Yisrael or B'nai Yisrael, the people of Israel, um, as a collective all throughout history. But it, it is a biblical name, so I'm not surprised that it does show up in various places. But I don't know if it, I don't think it had to do anything with the Jewish community. Um, the, uh, like the synagogue in Centralia that closed was called Adith Israel, uh, which means community of Israel. Um, and I think the one in, yeah, I don't remember what the one in, I think the one in Aberdeen also has Israel in the name. So. We're at about time, but do you have time for one more yeah. question? Okay. Yeah, I can stay here all night. Oh, well, never yeah. mind. We're no, done. No. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any sense of why uh, Olympia was chosen as for the early ancestors? Like, how did they end up here? And second, was there, how were they treated? Was there you know, anti-Semitism here, and one ended up being the mayor, that was pretty, or the governor. Yeah. So do you, do you know any of that history? Um, I think so, I mean, I think some, I, it's, it's interesting, I'm not exactly sure why, although I think that part of the early settlements in, the, in this area were in the South Sound, right? So um, probably followed that pattern, or maybe they just got tired going up to Seattle. I mean, I mean so is it early, uh, I mean, there was kind of a back and forth, right, between Olympia and Seattle, like for prominence at that at that point as well. So I'm not exactly sure. That's a great question. I think that uh, you know a lot. What was that? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, I I wouldn't be surprised. I think that a lot of there are. I mean, I did come across some accounts of you know. I think that these early settlers were were also very much kind of assimilationists. You know, again, they weren't really. Um, Again, they didn't really form a synagogue, right? They didn't want sort of an outward expectation. I mean, there was something about burial that's important. You know, I think we can uh, sort of see why. But obviously, those people didn't form a synagogue. They weren't necessarily interested, I think, in, uh, you know, they, they found their, their um, uh, social gatherings through the Masons or others. They probably, you know, associated with each other, but, um, but didn't do that. And I think that so... I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some bias, but they also, I think, tried very hard not to sort of say, but yeah, like he was, they were involved in civic affairs. They were, he was the mayor. Um, I think you do find some in early, uh, I think with the next wave, you probably do find some more anti-Semitism. There was a, uh, in our, in a history, we have a history, uh, somebody wrote a history of Temple Beth Atfilo, um, Eva Goldberg, and then Dan Rosell updated it. It's ends in 1995, so it doesn't go all the way. But there's uh, interesting um, stories about how in the 20s and 30s you have like ish, uh, instances where the silver shirts or like neo-Nazis will showed up in Olympia. And uh, as we know, they have before. And, uh, but even back then. But it was also kind of described that, you know, these, some of these families were kind of well known and prominent. So they had a lot of support and allies. So I'm sure they experienced some, but also had some community connections uh, in there as well. So yeah, that's a great, that's a, that's a great question. Nothing too overt, I guess, is what, you know, there's nothing that I came across where the, you know, synagogue was attacked or anything like that, you know, throughout the history. Only more recently <laughs> we're getting it, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. What I found when I moved here was that it was a very closeted community. I joined Temple Beth Hatfield because I was asking for an endorsement for an anti-war initiative that I was working on. They said, you have to go to our social justice committee. And, and I said, well, when do they meet? Well, they don't. But if you join our temple and chair it, then you'll get your endorsement. <laughs> um, and I got, I did a lot of work, put on a lot of programs, but people were very fearful that the that the programs like about um, prayer in public schools would be too controversial and it would cause a backlash. But there was a very palpable sense that we're um, on the far fringe of diaspora here and it's not, you know, don't make waves. And, you know, going back to the slide that you showed just to emphasize something that um, Rabbi Seth said, the, the immigration, if you can, 
each each one of those waves represents um, an expulsion of people, wholesale pushing out or or murder of large numbers of people to where they felt like they had to leave and had to go someplace new. I mean, a lot of immigration to the United States has been based on hunger and warfare. Um, virtually all Jewish immigration to any place in the world is trying to find a place of refuge. So Olympia was a place of refuge, but it was a kind of a closeted place of refuge, in my experience. Mm. Thank you. Debbie, you're gonna join the temple again? Oh, that's right. <laughs> Uh, a couple years. Okay. <laughs> you could use a chair of the social justice committee. <laughs> well, thank you so much. That will conclude our program this evening. Can we get a round of applause for Rabbi Seth Goldstein? Thank you. Thank you so thank much you. for your presentation. And thank, thank you, you for all the for opportunity. Joining us. It was great to, like, I had, um, you know, read some of this, but it was nice to give have this opportunity to kind of put something together, you know, and to sort of think about it. So thank you so much. Uh, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good night. We'll see you next next month.